To understand how the body cavities develop, we're going to start at the trilaminar embryo stage. The trilaminar embryo is basically three stacked sheets of undifferentiated cells. These consist of the notochord, which induces signaling changes in all three layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. Now, I have a whole video on development of the embryo from one cell up to the trilaminar stage. If these terms are a little bit unusual or unfamiliar to you, I'd recommend you go and review it. I'll put the link below. And basically, these tissues will create the entire body. Now, up above the ectoderm is a space called the amniotic cavity, and it will eventually surround the entire embryo. And the formation of the body cavities is actually intimately tied to how that cavity surrounds the embryo. Surrounding the primary yolk sac is the endoderm, and the primary yolk sac will dwindle to pretty much nothing as development proceeds, but the endoderm will form the lining first of the gut tube, and a little remnant of the yolk sac will be present just inside that lining. The mesoderm itself needs to be subdivided into the paraxial mesoderm, which is going to differentiate into cell mites, the intermediate mesoderm, which will become the urogenital system, and the lateral plate mesoderm, and this is going to be one of the major players in this process. As we move a little further along in development, the ectoderm has developed a neural groove. This is the start of the central nervous system. Nearby, we have spaces developing in between the lateral plate mesoderm, and they're actually going to separate the lateral plate mesoderm into two parts, the parietal layer and the visceral layer. You may also hear these referred to as the somatic layer and the splanchnic layer. Parietal is going to form the body wall, and visceral is going to form the surrounding of the organs, and that's a pretty useful generalization. We'll follow a little bit further as we go. As development proceeds, the split becomes very apparent between the two layers of lateral plate mesoderm, and we wind up with an actual indentation there. The parietal layer of lateral plate mesoderm is riding along with the ectoderm, and it's going to start moving inferiorly and starting to wrap around the remainder of the embryo. Meanwhile, the primary yolk sac gets pinched very tightly, leaving the visceral layer of lateral plate mesoderm enveloping what will become the gut tube. The gut tube has become so pinched off that even though it's lined by endoderm, and even though it's still connected to the body by the visceral layer of lateral plate mesoderm, the connection that it has to the yolk sac becomes incredibly tenuous. We only have a very thin, what's referred to as a vitiline duct connecting it, and eventually the yolk sac will rescind completely. And that's because we have the parietal layer of lateral plate mesoderm moving around on either side, lined by ectoderm, and these two edges are going to meet each other and completely seal off the body, creating a cavity called the intraembryonic coelom, or the intraembryonic cavity. As that happens, it's pulling the amniotic cavity around the embryo in its entirety, and the amniotic fluid is the water that we refer to as when someone's water breaks when they're giving birth. This cavity and the fluid within it will com almost completely surround the embryo throughout further development. Now the ectoderm remains in contact with the surface of the embryo. It's going to form the epidermis, and it also forms the spinal cord and brain. It gets surrounded by some of the somite mesoderm, specifically the osteotome, forming the axial skeleton, and nearby are the myotome and dermatome, forming some of the muscles of the body and the dermal layer of the body in particular. The intermediate mesoderm does a lot of interesting things, making the kidneys and gonads. We're not going to follow it any further in this talk, but it is still moving along. And the dorsal aorta is now present very close to the center of all this development, and it will be supplying blood to all these developing tissues. Now we've completely sealed off the intraembryonic cavity. The anterior body wall has been completely formed from thorax down to pelvis by the parietal layer of lateral plate mesoderm and its surrounding ectoderm. The intraembryonic coelom is a completely separate space from the outside, and the gut tube line by endoderm is surrounded and suspended by its own mesentery, and you can see a little vessel coming through the mesentery from the aorta to supply it, and those support tissues and the mesentery come from the visceral layer of lateral plate mesoderm. Amniotic cavity more or less surrounds the embryo completely, there's the epiderm again, and now we're going to take a little step 
back and come back to this picture after we take a quick look at a video. All right, a little quick aside to understand how the intraembryonic coelom forms and will eventually make the peritoneal and pericardial cavities, I've used my vast resources in my research lab, aka pool noodle, to demonstrate that. The embryo is basically a disc, and that coelom, that space, forms on the lateral side and the cranial side of the developing embryo. But as the heart develops and the brain enlarges, the cranial part actually folds anteriorly to make a little bend like this. The heart grows into it as the head and brain roll a little more anteriorly. So this is basically the space that's present at the time. And notice it's connected from bottom to top. And the partitioning of these spaces is what we're going to be discussing next. So we've seen that the intraembryonic coelom forms a little bit of a horseshoe-shaped cavity around not only the lateral side of the body, but also around the head. Here, what we're viewing is the ectoderm, but we're looking at it from a sagittal cut, so a sideways view of a mid-section cut of the developing embryo. Endoderm is just below it, and there's a place just ahead of where the brain is forming, right here, called the stomodium, and it's a place where the ectoderm and endoderm remain completely adherent to each other. Now just cranial to that, interestingly enough, is our developing heart. Our heart actually develops in front of our brain early on, and the intraembryonic coelom passes through that space as well. So it's just at the kind of midway point of that horseshoe, at the bend. Now outside of that is a layer of mesoderm, and in particular a spot we call the septum transversum. And it's going to be a big important player in just a moment. Because as the embryo enlarges and folds, that heart developing area gets tucked underneath, ventral to, the body. And that's why the heart winds up in our chest. Now, the developing brain, coming from ectoderm, is still present, getting bigger. The gut tube is developing from endoderm, but we have mesoderm present between them at this point. However, the stomodium remains a thin membrane, which will eventually rupture, making the mouth. And that happens well after all this folding has occurred. Meanwhile, the developing heart and the intraembryonic coelom near it, which is going to become the pericardial cavity, keeps tucking up and under more ventrally into the thoracic region. And that big wedge of mesoderm called the septum transversum comes along for the ride. And, quick preview of what's coming up, it's going to form the diaphragm, or at least a significant part of it. As we keep folding, the heart's been tucked in ventrally here. We have the developing brain right there, stomodium, forming an early mouth connecting to the gut tube from the outside, and that's why once it ruptures we'll have communication from the outside into our foregut. The vitelline duct leading to the yolk sac is present a little further along, but now I want you to note that septum transversum. It's hanging out between the abdominal region and the thoracic region, and that's why it's going to contribute to the diaphragm. Please note, however, we've got the developing heart pushing into the pericardial cavity. A little pink layer here is going to form, pink layer lining the heart, is going to form the visceral pericardium. I'm not going to continue drawing it in any further illustrations, but do note that it's there. And the pericardial cavity that it's pushing into will form the pericardial cavity of the adult. And at this point, that horseshoe still exists. It's still connected to the peritoneal cavity, but that's about to change in a process I'm going to describe right now. If we take a cut right through that septum transversum and look at it in an axial view, we'd see something like this. There's that septum transversum. And we still have the intraembryonic coelom. But in this region, they have a special name for it called the pericardial peritoneal canals are connecting the pericardial and peritoneal cavities. As development proceeds, little folds from the lateral wall start to close those canals. Those little folds are called pleuroperitoneal folds. And they get bigger and bigger until they actually close off this space entirely and fuse to the septum transversum. And that takes us to our next picture. They're going to push in. And now we've got something a little more complicated looking. The septum transversum is going to become the central tendon of the diaphragm. It's still very much in the middle. The pleuroperitoneal folds contribute a little bit laterally and posteriorly, 
by fusing completely to the septum transversum. And then the majority of the muscle in our diaphragm actually comes from the body wall. It actually grows in from the outside. Now failure of this process, particularly of the pleuroperitoneal folds to fuse to the septum transversum, can result in a hernia of gut into the thorax during development. The abdominal contents are under a great deal of pressure during development, and if there's a hole, because these pleuroperitoneal folds didn't close properly, then the gut will push up, usually into the left pleural cavity, compressing the lungs, and maybe even pushing the heart further to the right. And that's incompatible with life outside the womb and has to be caught early and corrected in utero. So that's development of the diaphragm and how it affected this and how we got a separate cavity in the thorax from the abdomen. To see a little bit more about how that proceeds, we're going to do a similar cut at the level of the heart. And here's what we see there. The heart's right there. It sits within a pericardial cavity, which at this point is still connected to the peritoneal cavity by means of those pericardio-peritoneal canals. And now, I've drawn the foregut, but I've also drawn the developing lungs. The lungs come from a respiratory diverticulum that blebs off the foregut, and little tracheoesophageal ridges separate it from the foregut, and it's going to form little lung buds on the right and left that are going to form the lungs. Nearby is a fold of tissue containing the phrenic nerve, which innervates the diaphragm, and some of the cardinal veins, which will form the great veins leading up to the heart. As development proceeds, those lung buds get bigger and bigger, and from front to back, we have the aorta, the foregut, a completely separate trachea, and as I mentioned before, these expanding lungs push into that space. They fill the space that's there, and they compress the space around the heart. The pleural space enlarges, and as it does so, it doesn't invade the pericardial space. It pushes that fold of tissue containing the phrenic nerve ahead of it, and that's going to essentially seal off the pericardial cavity. We're going to go another step further. As the lungs continue to develop, it's like they carve out some of that tissue and wind up completely surrounding the lateral aspect of the heart. And as that proceeds even further, we get to the mature conformation, where the lungs have wrapped more or less around the heart completely. We have a com uh, totally separate pericardial space. We have a right and a left pleural space here and here. We've got the phrenic nerves inside lining the wall of the pericardium. And that is how we get the spaces of the body. I hope this has been helpful, and happy studying.